I guess, yeah. I mean, you know. Everything. But, you know, it just seems like jazz is one of those things when you either do it like, you know, full hearted. Yeah. Or you can immediately hear it that it's just kind of like, you know. Yeah. That you are more into Green Day. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Green Day had really a good. Two good albums, so... Oh, absolutely, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, you know what I mean. It's just like, you know... No, 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 yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny, I, I'm doing this talk now. You know Andy Shepard, the saxophone yeah. player? Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this talk uh, with him, like, in the following weeks. And, um, you know, I've been listening to his music a, long, a, a, a lot, right? And mm -hmm. I didn't know he's self-taught. And, like, I really have... I didn't know either. <laughs> he didn't study, and he just started playing saxophone when he was 19 after hearing Coltrane... And then he just like dug into that. And I really want to ask him about that. How, how does this work? You know, like. The... That's pretty amazing. I did not know that either, you know. Oh. Yeah, quite, quite interesting. But yeah, Ru Rudy, I want to, you know, I've, I've been listening since we met in New York and you gave me those CDs and I saw you in Leibniz and Life. I, I kind of followed your music all the time, like, you know, various platforms and everything. And. You've done such an amazing amount of work, you know, like I'm a guitarist, like uh, being all these guitar trios you did, I, I want to talk about them. And uh, you seem to really love this version, bass, drums and guitar. So, but, uh, you know, I think your story is so fascinating and that's why I want to go really way, way back. Way back. And, yeah, because, you know, I think we're, we're, we kind of come from similar behind the Iron Curtain, in a way, you know, we were in Yugoslavia, you were in the Czech Republic, maybe in the Czech was even worse, I guess. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, we, we needed a permit to go to Yugoslavia. <laughs> you didn't yeah, we could at least travel, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it's also cool. Anyway, so. But uh, what, what were like in the Czech Republic, do you remember what were those triggers? I guess this we're, we're talking about the 70s, right? Mid 70s. Mm -hmm. What were those jazz triggers that in your teenager years, like what were those records that that you heard jazz records, which were like, wow, what the F is this, you know? Right. Well, I, I have to say that even before the records, I met some people which played jazz. Okay. And they were so much fun. I mean, they, they were joking all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like to this day, I think the jazz musicians are the some of them are the funniest guys on the planet and and their humor is a little different it's yeah. it, it's just uh, it's very dry and 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 I, I i just love that and and um and i i um you know i got this one lp which was uh, that was miles davis greatest hits greatest hits. Okay. miles davis greatest hits. and you know it was it's amazing stuff on it you know like so what and 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 the musicians we played like the, i mean Today, I mean, I understand that it was literally the greatest hit as were on this album, and and I um, and I loved that album, and I was just uh, you know I was just trying to figure out where can I get more LPs, and it was American Embassy. They had a culture center. Oh. You just walk in there from the street, and you could borrow LPs. They had like I don't know hundred LPs, and you could borrow them, and you just bring them back after one week. So I always borrow LPs and I will, you know, tape them on the tape recorder and just put them back. And right. one of those albums where, I, I'm sure you know that this was this Carnegie Hall concert of Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan. Yeah, yeah, with Schofield actually, right? With Schofield on it, who was at that time was 22 years old. And yeah. I love that album and, and yeah. Chet plays fantastic on it. Yeah, you know? it's amazing, yeah. And I have to say that at that time I, you know, I didn't speak any English. So I was just like, you know, I took it, you know, and, so, and I was like 16 years old. And it would never enter my mind that when I will be 26, I would actually know John Schofield. And he would tell me about this recording. And he was he was telling me like, he was so nervous because 
he never recorded anything. This is his first recording ever. Yeah. yeah. And he never played with these guys. And it was in Carnegie Hall. And he just borrowed a car from his sister and took his amp and drove to Carnegie Hall and get out there. And, and he said he was scared to death, you know, and, and I just, I just, you know, it's sometimes it's really, I still have to pinch me that this is really happening to me. You, you know what I mean? That these, yeah. these albums kind of came alive, you, you know, somehow. Yeah, makes sense. That's, that's amazing. But the, uh, did, did you then start collecting? Like, I mean, how did you go, the, dig into improvisation? Because I think you studied in Prague, right? I studied in Prague, and you know, I was uh, uh, I was playing violin for nine years until I was fourteen. And after that, I, you know, I heard Beatles and you know this stuff, and I stopped the violin, cold turkey, and I started to play the guitar. And and uh, and I was you know just kind of listening to Beatles and trying to figure it out, but just because I was playing violin for so long time, so I understood that it would be good to study classical guitar. So yeah. I started wow. to study classical guitar and, and after that I got the conservatory and I was I was there just for one year. And and after that I left from Sweden for Sweden. But um, and I you know and and I always try to figure out, you know, more information about jazz and how to improvise because nobody knew anything. You know, we yeah. were always just doing it kind of you know, just by like, oh, probably this. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. It's just like, and we were, you know, and and I I thought that if I move to Sweden, so Sweden will have all the answers and all the informations, and that was not the case either. You know, 1980 in Sweden, basically they were just, you know. So I again, I was studying there, and again, classical guitar and compositions, and and, and it was until I get to Berkeley, 85. Mm -hmm. When I kind of started to stu study jazz, and uh, well, you know, well, why Sweden? First of all, I mean, why Sweden? Why Sweden? Well, because uh, first, uh, when I was <laughs> why Sweden? Well, first, I was studying German for you know, like the longest time, like in like ten years, and I could not really speak it. So I knew that I should not stay in Germany because okay. I know I'm not able to speak German. So okay. that was clear to me. And and after that, I was you know I really loved the uh, you know Scandinavia. It's a you know it's a neutral country. It's yeah. it has a kind of myst mysterious kind of thing about them. I mean, I think it's almost like you know, the Indian tribe of Europe, you know, Scandinavia, you know, just like Norway. This is like, you know, Jan Garber. Right. I mean, it's a, it's, it has its own little thing and it has fantastic musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Bobo Stenson, Paula Danielson, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you name it. I mean, this is like, and not just that, but ABBA, you know, such mm -hmm. a small country and they produced, uh, you know, really, you know, some really f spectacular musicians. Yeah. So I went to, to Sweden and also one of my best friends, a saxophone player from school. So he stayed there like six months. He immigrated six months ago, uh, six months before me. So okay. I knew that I have him in Stockholm. So, you know, so I went to Stockholm and I stayed with him for three months. And, and after that, we, we had a fight and I never talked to him again. <laughs> wow, okay. Yikes. <laughs> well, okay, that was a good jumping board into... Yeah, 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 but you know, it's it's so funny because I mean, yeah. just living in, uh, in a in a in close society, I mean, I have no clue about anything in the yeah. world. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, how I was the most naive, uh, you know, unprepared guy. I didn't have a driving license. I couldn't speak any language. You know, I mean, you name it. I could not cook. You know, I could not clean. I, I, I nothing. And yeah. somehow I just felt like. The world is just, uh, you know, full of fun, and I should be part of it. <laughs> you know, so, so. That's that's a good one. But, the, but the, you you mentioned then, okay, Berkeley, right? And like speaking about this close thing, you know, like what did the states then do to you? Like, what was your initial rea reaction when you came to Boston to Berkeley? I mean, you know, so this is really interesting because I was I was in Sweden for five years and. Yeah. Uh, in Sweden, I uh, first I came there when I was so young, and uh, there is something about to be, you know, twenty and excited. And I, I learned Swedish, you know, pretty quickly. And I met my wife, you know, after like three months. And uh, and I met all the musicians. And I was hanging at the jazz club, and I started to play with uh, Red Mitchell. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, incredible. And, you know, I, I kind of 
and I have really loved it. And suddenly I got this scholarship to Berkeley. And, and I really felt like I am going there. I will be there one year because that's my scholarship. And I go back and I already had a Swedish passport. And, you know, we just got married. And, and, and I totally saw myself, I am in Sweden. And after it, we showed up in the United States. And I have to say that, you know, 1985, the states were so different than they are today. Yeah, can imagine. Trump didn't exist. Oh, he existed, but he was somewhere like, you know, building uh, buildings or something. But yeah, it was, you get immediately this feeling of everything is possible. Everybody's so open. Everybody's so friendly. Nobody cares, you know, uh, if you have a million dollars or two dollars in your pocket. It was just, it's really, um, and I have to say, especially New York, because I came to Boston, but we actually, with my wife, came to New York because Anna got a scholarship to Columbia. So she oh, was wow. studying film at Columbia University and I was in Boston and we, we were commuting uh, between these two cities. And after a few commutes back and forth, we decided, no, I will just go to New York every weekend. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, of course. Boston is beautiful. But, you know, Boston is something like maybe Geneva or, you know, I yeah. mean, it can be, you can be Copenhagen. I mean, it's it, New York is totally different. And uh, especially when you are doing something like music, you know, if you are into writing or if you are architect or something, I mean, there are so many people, everybody's trying to do something and everybody's a little crazy. Yeah. And I mean, in the positive way. And, uh, and uh, so I was starting to come to New York and, uh, and today I feel like, uh, you know, if you are not born somewhere, if you don't live somewhere where you are born, there's only one place when you still can feel totally like home, and that's New York. <laughs> that's like an advertisement for New York now. Right? And I mean it, you know, I mean it even today when it's like, you know, we, I was in my home country for nine months yeah. and I was thinking, oh my gosh, and now I go to New York and it's like, it will be so depressing because everything is closed, you know, and it's yeah. just like, you know, no music happening. I mean, this is like, I, you know, and the moment I showed up here, I love it again. And now you get this feeling of that, well, I live here 35 years, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, so, but I really, you know, I really like the cosmopolitan thing. I like yeah. the, you know, all the energy you get, even if it's half. So it's still enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> still yeah. More than other places. <laughs> Amazing. But, but you, you came, so you went to, to Boston, then to New York, right? And uh, do you remember like, so 85, 86, you know, New York, is, I will never forget that the first time I came to New York when we met also. And then it's, there's like this gazette all about jazz. And, you know, there's like every day 60 jazz concerts listed then. Absolutely. And what was like that? You know, when, when, when I told them people when I came back here, they were like, no, you're kidding. No, you know, it's that's it. It's even more not listed. But like, how was it for you? Like in 85, 86? You know, did you do you remember some concerts you saw like in the beginning or like what? I mean, Samo, I mean, you have no idea. I was so excited. I I bought a Walkman professional. You know, at that time it was Walkman. Walkman, you know, yeah. And Sony was doing Walkman professional, you know, which was actually sounded really good. And I bought a tiny microphone and to every concert which we went, I taped that concert. Oh, wow. And now I have these tapes, you know, and that's that's like, you know, that can be like steps ahead at the bottom line, you know, Nibble, or uh, John Abercrombie, you know, at uh, Fat Tuesdays, wow. uh, Ralph Downer. I mean, just fantastic thing. And uh, but here's the funny thing. When I was uh, when I was playing with Red in uh, in Sweden. So, you know, I was copying Jim Hall all the time. This was my you know thing. And, and so we play one day, we played and Red suddenly says, oh, man, Rudy. You sound like Jim. I mean, I have to call Jim and I have to let him know that here is a guy, you know, who sounds like him. And he went, you know, to the, the telephone and to pick up the telephone. Just, just uh, Jim, hi, this is Red. You know, yes, I've got it. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, here's a guy. His name is Rudy Linka. He sounds like you. Do remember Rudy Linka, you know, and hang up. And I was like, oh my God. Now it's like, you know, now Jim knows about me. And it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, two years later, I am suddenly at Village Vanguard and Jim plays, you know, with his trio. With uh, 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 Steve Laspina and uh, uh, what's his name Terry Clark. Terry Clark, oh yeah. 
and uh, uh, and I was, uh, and so I was, you know, there into, and just when it had a break, and Jim was just walking off the stage, so I come, you know, and say, "Hi, Jim. You know, my name is Rudy Linka." And he looks at me like, "And what?" And I said to him, "Rudy Linka." And he goes, "And?" And I said, "Well, I am the guy who Red Mitchell called you about, you know, two years ago." And he goes, "Huh." That's interesting because I didn't talk to Red for seven years. <laughs> so, That's a good this day. I have no idea why Red did this to me because it's it was a he just wanted to make me happy somehow. But it was I mean, so so I was standing there looking at him like what? And, and Jim saw this and see he says, "But what do you want, Jim?" And I said, "Well, Jim, I would like to study with you." And he goes, "But I'm not teaching." And I said, oh, OK. And I was I was so devastated. He suddenly said, OK, write your telephone number here on my music. And I wrote my telephone number. And he said, you know, and now this was, this was like in August. And on December 24th, like three in the afternoon, on Christmas Eve, telephone rings. And I pick it up and he goes, hello, this is Jim Hall. May I speak to Rudy Linka? And I go, that's me. He goes, I'm calling about the lessons. <laughs> and wow. we start to have a lessons, which was once a week. And I didn't pay anything because first, I didn't have any money. But the second, he said, you know, so many people help me in my life that I am okay to help you. Wow. I, I just, you know, it, it was for me, it was just, and maybe that's why I kind of feel like New York is a place where I, to be. You know what I mean? It's just like there was there is no other place on the planet which uh, something like that well, probably is, but I don't yeah. know. It happened to me here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So uh, 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 how did these lessons, I mean, like with Jim look like? Right? I mean, huh. the lessons with Jim, you know, and that was really funny because, you, you know, as I was in Czech Republic and trying to figure out, you know, the information about how to play jazz. Yeah. And after that, being at Berkeley for one year and get so many information about upper structure, upper structure tryout, right. you know, and whatnot, and and you know, and you suddenly study with the master, and he will never give you anything like that, never ever. But his lines were much more, and and you know, the lessons were first; they were not lessons. I mean, we just met, we played together, Play and standard. I, he said. Let's listen to some music. And he would be playing LPs, you know, we were listening, we were have ice cream, you know, and after we play some more, after they go home. And it's four hours. Wow. And I start to understand that, you know, that's how it should be, you know, except nobody can do that. I mean, it's just yeah. like, you, know, you cannot really be hanging with somebody for four hours and not getting paid, you know, and, and you know, but Jim really, uh, really did it for me. And, and I have to say his lines, which were so, uh, you know, for example, one of, one of them was like this. You know, I'm, or the best thing was they would play something and then suddenly I would play his, you know, things which I copy from him. He stopped and he goes, what was that? And I said to him, well, I copied it from you. And he goes, that sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> and we were laughing. But, you know, I mean, it's so his thing was, you know, once he stopped me and said, you know, don't just play, say something. Yeah, beautiful. And I have to say, just because first, it's a great line. Don't just play. Yeah, that's true. Now, when it says somebody like, you know, Jim Hall, so I went home, you know, and I was thinking about it. To this day, I'm thinking about it. You, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's, 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 it's exactly what, because John Schofield told me, what, you know, that year when we met, like in New York, Mm -hmm. we, we played, you know, sometimes in his basement, and uh, uh, this is exactly, you know, uh, the only thing I really remember is like he said, like Samo, think like a saxophone player, breathe. Yeah, that's it. Information because you can actually develop that information your whole life. Yeah, you know what I mean. You yeah. can, you know, I mean, uh, you know, when I when I studied with John Schofield, so he said to me one this. Yeah, how was that? Yeah, he, he said to me this. He said. You know, maybe you can make it dance more. Wow, yeah. Which is, I mean, what a great line. 
I mean, you can be working on it your whole freaking life, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. which is the best thing because I, re I really do. Th and, and that was, you know, another information which really happened with G Jim, which was there were many, but one which really stuck with me. It was this one day Jim said to me, you know, my whole life I was trying to sound like Charlie Christian and I really did not succeed. Well, and he was really sad about it. You know what I mean? And at that moment, I look at him and it was clear to me that, wait a minute, here is a guy who has his own sound. He did accomplish absolutely everything. And he honestly tells you that he did not succeed in sounded like Charlie Christian, mm -hmm. which means we all love somebody. John Schofield, Ralph Thunder, you know, Pat Metheny, you can name it. Yeah. And we will not succeed to sound exactly like them because the reason why we play is for some different reason. It's about yeah. being inspired by these guys. And after it, you follow your own path. But it, this line really kind of opened my eyes about this whole thing, you know, what, uh, you know, how much psychology it is in music. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, by the way, how much do you charge me for this session? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the PayPal bill later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the bill will show up here from the computer, like a little printout, you know, at the end. Of it <laughs> automatically goes off from your PayPal. So. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's it's you know you know it's incredible. Like what what you mentioned is like you know, like it's these small lines learning from these giants. You know, you know, the, these guys could have told you about anything, like playing, like, like you said, you know, yeah, you play these pentatonics over those chords and that, and it would sound like blah, 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 that, which you can read in any book, right? Exactly. But yeah. you remember just this lines, and this is, that, that's, that's so cool, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I wanted to ask you, Rudy, when did the story then, like, you, you know, you've learned basically and then also play it later. I mean, I, I want to talk about that too, but like with some of my favorite guitarists, like Jim and the two Johns, John Abercrombie and Schofield. And I wanted to ask you, like, how did the story with uh, Sco begin with John? Well, that was really funny because when I was at uh, at, uh, at Berkeley, so he showed up to do a clinic. And uh, and it was just the moment when he left Miles. It was like, oh, yeah. I think, 85. 85, yeah. Maybe eighty six, so, you know, somewhere there, and and uh, he suddenly left Miles and and really did not have so much, you know, going on, you know, yet. And and I, I said to him, John, you know, can I study with you? And he said, I said yes, yes, yes. And he at that time was living in um, uh, West Village in the uh, artist building, which oh. is called West Beth. And 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 so we so we met, and it was really funny because I remember you know coming from Europe, and it's just like you have the national theater, you know, or the concert halls, everything is so beautiful, you know, and 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 suddenly I go you know to lesson with this guy who is the most famous guy. I saw him so many times, you know, in Sweden, and he played a little bit Miles, and you know it was just like and and I walk into the building, and after that. I took the elevator, it was like three floors down. It was like a minus three, oh, all the way to the basement. And there was pipes and they were leaking, you know, and, and, and I came to his studio, which was like, I would never ever imagine that John is actually, you know, in this place, yeah. playing on that. And, and, and we met and, and the funny thing, and I just remember it so clearly because John said, so what do you want to play? And I said, well, let's play all the things you are. And we started to play and John closed his eyes and he played like he plays with Miles Davis. Oh, You know, and I, I was just watching this, how amazing it is. Because to that point, I always, always saw him, he's on the stage or he plays from an LP. Yeah. Which is, yeah, yeah, in the studio, you know, there blah, 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 blah. But suddenly he plays in this, piece of shit room like you know for me you know like but and at that moment you would start to understand that some people are you know there is no trick to this there is absolutely no nothing there is no magic box or you know yeah. some microphone which will make you sound fantastic it's just like you plug it on here and you just go and and he really he really did that and it's uh and after that lesson i was really you know quite depressed <laughs> 
because he's so damn good. And 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 his feel is so fantastic, mm. and his groove is so fantastic. Yeah. You know, and I, and I immediately immediately understood that my groove sucks. You know, and 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 I was looking at him, and I said, John, you know, I just I, my rhythm sucks. And he said to me, Oh, your rhythm is fine. You just don't groove so hard. <laughs> You know, and it's, and again, coming from Europe, it, this is really funny. This this whole thing about groove, yeah, rhythm, it's different in Europe because uh, you know our music, our European music is more classical, I guess, yeah, or and it's you yeah. know the rhythm is there, fantastic and everything, but but it's not groovy music. It's, yeah. it's you know it's it's you know it's not it's not like that. And I remember when I you know was. Um, in San Francisco, I was staying at the house where Joe Henderson lived. Oh. And it was a friend of mine who was actually, you know, living on the upper floor. And, and we had a breakfast and suddenly Joe Henderson showed up and he was having breakfast with us. And, and you know, and I immediately said, Joe, man, how do you practice, you know? <laughs> and he said to me this, which was, I mean, to this day, again, I, I cannot do it. He said to me, well, you know, I go up and, you know, I try to... I try to swing for like two hours, you know, and I, you know, I'm trying to swing for two hours after that I have lunch. And after lunch, I try to swing some more. <laughs> so, sounds so easy, right? Which is exactly that. You know, this whole thing of, okay, you figure out some line and now to make that line swing. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's another lifetime, you know, and after you have all these lines and everyone is just right there and, and, and it's swings. It's, you know, it's a little different, it's a little different approach and it's, uh, you know, it's, and it's good to be with musicians who are actually doing it all the time, which is so amazing with John Schofield that he basically really wasn't, you know, I mean, he's from Connecticut. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, why the guy from Connecticut? I mean, I mean, he is, he has such an amazing feel, like if he is from New Orleans, so, you, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, yeah, like laid back, really. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. So, so there is a yeah. hope for all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's just awesome. I mean, but I, I want to ask you about what's, I think I read somewhere about, or, or did someone tell me, I don't know, about you guys busking in Prague or something like that? Oh, we were, you know, we were actually, that was funny because we were, you know, we, we really connected well and we started to be real good friends and our yeah. wives are friends and we, uh, you know, we had children and they, they were almost the same age and, yeah. and so we were hanging all the time. And one day we went to, on vacation to Prague and we were there for a week and suddenly Susan, John's wife, yeah. she suddenly said, she read in some, you know, guidebook about that musicians are playing on Charles Bridge, you yes. know, and she said, okay, guys, so now you will go and play on the Charles Bridge and we will have a dinner and it can cost only the money which you made, you know, and we were like, what? You know, it's just like, that's really sad. But, you know, so we, we had two acoustic guitars, so we went there, you know, we sat on the bridge, we started to play. The police showed up like immediately and wanted to, wanted to have, wanted to see permit because you have to have permits for everything. And yeah. so, we didn't have the permit, but there was started to be a really big crowd, and um, and um, and it was a, a crew from Czech, Czech television which was walking by. So they started to film it. How this police is, you know, just like, and uh, finally the police said, "Okay, so you can finish the song. You can play one song, and after you have to get the hell out of here." So we finished that one song. I think we played alone together. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and after we split, so I mean, we didn't make any money. I mean, it was just nothing. Bizarre. But you know, the main news on a, on a you know Czech television, like nine o'clock news, and there we were. <laughs> we play on the, and it was so funny because John, we were watching it, and after John looked at me and said, "So what? What are we doing tomorrow?" <laughs> <laughs> That's, you, you got a permit, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So it was, it was funny, but um, yeah. But, so that happened. But uh, how was it for you? Like you know, you did that really beautiful record, Lucky Southern, right? With Bo Johns, basically. Uh, how how was it like for you 
to hear John on your own tunes? Like, and how, how did you just ask him for that one or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it was funny because uh, that album, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of country jazz. Yeah, a little, it's yeah, almost. almost. Like it's so open, you know, and I just, yeah. I just wrote these tunes with, you know, these two guys in mind and, uh, and, and we just, it was basically the idea was that they will have, it will be so free so they can do whatever. And, uh, you know, and of course they do just the best, but I mean, it's, it's, it was really a lot of fun to do it. And uh, and it came out on the, the Austrian label, and uh, you know, yes. it's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, it's, it's 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 it was a fun fun project. You know, I know these two guys. I don't even remember when we recorded it. I mean, it was I think two thousand two or something. Three, it came out. Yeah, I checked. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and uh, and at that point, I knew these two guys from nineteen eighty six. You know, so it was not like, oh, it would be great to do an album with two yeah. charts. I love it. Completely different. I, yeah. I really knew them very well. And it's somehow, I, I think, you know, sometimes you can hear it on music, you know, that there is a, we are giving each other space, you know, there yeah. is never, and at the same time, we play, so it's intertwined, you know, together. So, uh, you know, it was, it was really honored to do it with them. And, uh, you know, John Abraham, and now we talked about John Schofield, you know. Yeah, so. I wanted to ask you about John. I, I saw like the other day, amazing duo. I don't know if you saw that, like from uh, uh, Athens, like Gazart Club or something like that. You and John Abercrombie playing duo from 2016. And it's so beautiful how thank you guys you. play it. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was really, that was really, that was very emotional to it because after Athens, we played in Munich, and that was the last concert of John Abercrombie. Seriously? Oh wow! I have no idea how could it happen because oh. we, uh, we, you know, from the moment we started to play, the room literally have a feeling of that something special is going on, and people were coming to John, and everybody was hugging him, and I somehow, when I remember, really bizarre because somehow, somehow. It felt like we all knew that this is John's last concert. I mean, I just, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's just, it's really bizarre. And, and, uh, and, uh, and John was not really well on this tour because we had it like two weeks of, and he had a very difficult time, you know, to travel. And, uh, and in Athens, he actually left his guitar at the, at the scanner. You know, and and, I and and I was in a different line, and suddenly we walk, and I said to him, "John, where is your guitar?" He goes, "Oh my gosh, where is my guitar?" I mean, John never did that. You know, I mean, <laughs> you don't leave your guitar, and so, yeah. so you, you know, so that was John was really in bad health at that time, but he played fantastic. Yeah, he played amazing. What I've heard. Like, it's just, it's just one of those things. I mean, and I have to say, he's he's probably the most underrated guy. I just wanted to say that, like, you know, we talk about Sco and Schofield, you know, he's, let's say, one of the big three modern jazz guitarists or, yeah, whatever, like, but he's amazing, right? And Abercrombie, he's like, I, I talk to every musician or jazz guitarist, they're like, yeah, John Abercrombie, like, you know, he's here. Mm -hmm. And, but commercially, somehow, because he, I guess he was such a humble guy or, like really this low profile, he, of course he made it, but not as much as he should have, I guess, you know. Yeah. I think it's partly maybe ECM did it also a little bit. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of a label for very few, but they will always be there. Fantastic. And, yeah. and, and John, you know, I think he's almost like an abstract painter. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, he's like a Paul Clay or, you know, Miro of, yeah. uh, of art, which is, I mean, it's just, you know, I, you know, I saw him so many times play and I played with him so many times. And every time I put him on and I listen to him, so I go, shit, how does he do this? You know, yeah. <laughs> because he is so, it's so abstract and swinging at the same time. Yeah. You, you know? I, it's, you know this tune Sco Motion he wrote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought one student today, this song, this waltz, it's a 3-4, and mm -hmm. you know the solo he plays there, it's just, you know, it's, it's just like... Because he can literally just be 
over the bars and it's just like and it's yeah. always melodic and suddenly yeah. he just makes it bang 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 and it swings like crazy and you go wow man it just yeah. like it it is really something it is you know he he had extreme talent i mean it's it's just yeah. because you know on the other hand i know that for example he was telling me like oh i'm trying to learn this donali man i cannot really get it man it's just like you know i'm trying yeah uh, uh, you would go like come on man it's just <laughs> just play the notes <laughs> you know but at the same time, he would play solo over it. Yeah. And it would sound like Charlie Parker. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It's like he could not get the head. But, you know, he, it's just a really talented guy, an extremely, extremely nice guy. I mean, it's, I think, you know, that's, um, you know, the, the history will be very, very good to him. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, speaking of John, you started to play also with him very early, like in the 90s, right? Like you had groups with him really early or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was basically, you know, he was on my first, very, very first recording, you yeah. know. And he was always so nice to me because, um, you know, I started to, uh, so after Berkeley, I went to new school. New school yeah. just opened up. And, and so that was like a big thing in at Berkeley, like, oh, there is a new school in New York about jazz, you know, just like, so I went and I was doing audition and I, I got a scholarship again because these schools are extremely expensive. I mean, it's yeah. absurd, you know, how much money they cost. It is, so yeah. I got a scholarship and we were 16 students. One of them was Larry Goldings. Really? Larry Goldings was, wow. and it was just one class for everybody. And, and I have to say, it was a lot of fun and uh, just because... Um, you can, and the guy who was running it, his name was Arnie Lawrence, saxophone player. Saxophone player, yeah. Saxophone player. He was exactly that guy who, no musical education, but living in New York City, he was, uh, you know, he was playing jam sessions with Charlie Parker, you know, I mean, he's like, the guy had like the best guys around him and, and, and he was a real jazz musician. You know, like you could not put him in a situation which would be like, uh, you know, that he would be like, I, I don't know what to do now. Yeah. And he was kind of trying to get it into us. You know what I mean? This kind of yeah. like, you as a jazz musician, you have to be prepared to do whatever. And you, if you are stepping in, it has to sound better than if you are not there. Yeah. Which is exactly. That's, you know, if you can say that's what you are doing in life. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. You know, he was telling us he was he had a uh, he was part of a, a, a orchestra of uh, Liza Minnelli. Oh, wow. and they were playing at uh, Radio City Hall, Radio City Music Hall, which is a big thing. I mean, it's a huge you know huge hall and everything. And and he was driving to the gig and he put the note, the music on the top of his car. You know, opened the car, sat in the car, and off. And now the music flies over Sixth Avenue, and it's just like. And of course, and he shows up. He has no music. And he said, so there was just one option to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I lost the music and, uh, you know, I am idiot and adios. <laughs> or to say, everything is fine, I memorized everything and try to fake it. Yeah. That's what he did. And he was able to do this. And I, I know that there are musicians like that in New York who are really this kind of, you know, okay, you want me to be absolutely, and, and they are able to do this. And I... Yeah really admire that and i uh, and so that he was opening the school and how i met john abercrombie was because the <laughs> so we all came to to arnie to his little office and he said so with who do you want to study and i said well i would love to study with john abercrombie and he goes oh john abercrombie and he had his little book you know to open up so here it's john abercrombie he called him and, hi john i have this guy he wants to study with you and i hear john says but i'm not going anywhere he has to come to me <laughs> <laughs> and I started to come to John, and John was living on 18th Street between Fifth and Sixth Avenue. Beautiful. Oh, he was in New York still, okay. And and very close to school. To school. And I remember I showed up at the you know at the lesson, and we played for two hours. And after that, John says, uh, "What about the dinner? Let's have a let's have a dinner." And we went to Italian restaurant. John paid for my dinner. <laughs> Just like he lost money to teaching me. <laughs> it was it was so funny, but. You know, so he was he was the guy who kind of, uh, you know, really, really made me feel home here. Yeah, he really did, you know, with, with all the other guys. But John was extremely generous. Uh, you know, there was, you know, he was just beautiful guy. Well, you had beautiful stories here yeah, with all these guys, like with 
Jim Hall and John and Schofield. Like it's beautiful that you know, kind of you made such nice relations with with all of them. Like you know, even the student teacher or whatever mentor thing. You know, it's. It, it, it is really something, you know, that you suddenly you, you just don't lose a track of somebody. You, you know what yeah. I mean? Your, your, your life is, they will be, and, and uh, you know, I, I, John's stories were, were fantastic, you know, and, and uh, we were on the tour, you know, with this quartet of uh, Lucky Sutton. Yeah. And John was flying home like two days before me. And after that, I flew back to New York and I called him and said, how was your flight? He goes, oh, the flight was good, but my house just burned down. <laughs> yeah, I know she had heard that. Yeah, you remember that, and you know, and he was, and he was telling me like how, he, yeah, how he just, you know, went to shuffle slow, and suddenly he turns around, and the, the house is on fire, and he lost absolutely everything, yeah. absolutely everything. I mean, everything, and guitars and, and everything, right? Yeah, and guitars and everything, yeah. and you know, and I was listening to it, and I said, John, that's terrible, you know, and she's like, and he said, but you know. You know, it's not so bad because, you know, I called the insurance company. I tell them everything. They said, so how many CDs did you have? And I told them and they said to me, you know, so we give you eight dollars per CD. And he said, that's really good because, you know, most of them I got for free. <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, John was always so funny. It doesn't matter what happened. You know, it was like, I felt like your house just burned down. Yeah, you are happy. <laughs> you get eight dollars per CD because you get it for free. He was so he was so good. He was really a fantastic guy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I saw him live so many times. I never got the chance to play with him, but you know, I saw uh, saw him live so many times playing in different lineups, and it's just I still put put on his music. Like you know, it's such a joy to listen to. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But really, I, I mentioned in the beginning of our talk, I just that, that you know. You seem to love guitar trios like bass, drums, and uh, and uh, you obviously. <laughs> so, but I wanted to ask you like the first one of the first really burning two trios that I heard of you were like that those Check It Out records with George Mraz, and I listened to that the other day. And for a certain time, I was obsessed with Marvin Sweety Smith because he played with Dave Holland, you know, and stick the guy. And uh, I listened to to, to to those records, uh, and there's one tune called called Bob's tune, if you remember. Oh right, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I do remember. And he's just like, <laughs> like everywhere. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, like, it, it sounds like a bizarre combination to me. You know, I mean, you played with all these amazing guys in that early period, like already Gil Goldstein and mm -hmm. Adam Nussbaum and all these incredible cats. But how did you come up with? I mean. With Marvin Smithy Smith and George Mraz, it's such an unusual combo. I mean, mm -hmm. unusual combo. But you know, the the funny thing is that I play with both of them in a different situation, and I felt like, well, they are both so musically, you know. Yeah. And Marvin is, I mean, I think he's one of the probably. I mean, he's one of the most kind of musical power drummers yeah. I met in my. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I mean, he can really play the shit out of the drums, yeah. and but at the same time, it makes music. It you know, it's it's it's, and uh, uh, and and George is fantastic. Yeah, George is like a, you, you know, I mean, you can doesn't matter what you do, you can never go wrong with George. I mean, yeah. it's uh, so, and I you know, when you said the trio, I really like, you know, I don't like rehearsals so much. I mean, I, basically, I have to say that my attitude is that uh, you know you kind of know immediately if it's fun to play with the guys yeah or doesn't yeah. matter how many rehearsals you do it will never be that fun yeah. you know? and they are and i probably i am probably even looking always for this kind of that things are open to just happen and and uh, so if it cannot be trio so i go with duo <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just like it's it's really funny because in duo you can even more, you know. But yeah. I, I always actually play with some great drummers, you know, really good, fantastic, yeah. drummers. incredible. And, yeah. and even now, you know, Rudy Royston is, you know, he's phenomenal. I mean, it's just it's, it's just so much fun to play with guys, which you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to talk about anything, and it's also they make your music better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, because I don't like to, 
be explaining things. Kenny Wallison is another guy. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's just like you, you say like, well, you know, I have this feeling that you should be playing on the, you know, why don't you play on the rim? That's that's my directions. <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that's enough. If you have Kenny Wallace, and that's like you know. Yeah, and 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 or somehow anyone. I just I just really you know I have to say that I I feel very blessed you know that I I was able to do it. That trio was fantastic. These two albums, it's funny because we got some. I, the first album got some got some prize in Germany. You like you know, like the best CD of the year or something? Oh, really? Oh, and well, yeah, guy, because it was on Angel, right? Yeah, it was on Angel. Yeah. And the guy wrote it, you know, in review that considering that uh, that the guy has such a bad sense of humor, it's really good music. <laughs> no, something like that. Because you know, it was you'll check it out. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that. Please double check. <laughs> I love that. And 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 so he was like kind of saying like, oh, this is such a bad humor song. So I remember that. So that was, but no, it really helped me. I mean, that was that was the moment when we, you know, started to play in Europe and people started to know me a little bit, yeah. because yeah. Um, you know, otherwise, otherwise I would be playing in New York and which would be totally fine. But yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's fun to go on tour and play, you know, yeah. every day for a few weeks. Yeah, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you, like, you know. I wrote down the drummers and the rhythm sections actually you played with. And it's, first of all, I wanted to ask you, how do you decide who to invite or how, how do you make a trio? You know, because you have like, okay, uh, Mike Formanek and Bill Stewart. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can wow. I please play them with them now? Okay. <laughs> like Rudy Royston, Larry Grenadier, Paul Motion, Larry Grenadier. And Kenny Wallace and some other, you know, incredible right. players. Like, how did you decide for all these bands? And well, you know, this is really funny because uh, 1985, when I got to New York, so all these guys were basically playing in the restaurants. You know, yeah. Mike Formanek. So I know Mike for so long time. So it, it is different because, of course, now we know Mike Formanek. You know, ECM. He's the head of this jazz, the you know, department in the. Uh, Peabody School, and I mean, it's it's like, you, you know, so, but at that time, it wasn't like that. I even remember that Joe Lavano was doing gigs for $20, you know, <laughs> when I just, yes. you know, it's just, there is always point in your life when things are different, and yeah. um, and I think it's just because, and, and Paul Motion was the first guy which I met uh, when I came to New York, and he was playing at, what was, after that was Visiones. Yeah. Uh, before that, it was a Spanish restaurant which is called Los Pepes, and it was no music whatsoever. And I walked by, and I suddenly look inside, and there is Bill Frizzell playing with Paul Motion. In wow! And there was absolutely nobody in the in the place except the owner, who kind of enjoyed the music, you know. So I went there, and I was sitting there, and saying, and after that, I went to talk to Bill because I met him before already in Stockholm. So I said, oh, how are you, Bill? You know, and, and Bill said, let me introduce you to Paul. And I and, and he said, Paul, this is Rudy. He just arrived. And Paul said, OK, here is my advice. Don't get mocked. <laughs> and that's how I met Paul. And from that moment, I kind of always, you know, when we when Paul was playing somewhere and I, you know, so I went to see him and we always kind of were talking. He was very, very sweet guy. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and uh, so when we were doing the recording, so he yeah, showed up. Like? Yeah. He showed up and he looked like he is going to the North Pole, you, you know, with his glasses, you know, how he was, you know, and, and me and Larry were just, you know, just regular guys. And, and Anna, my wife, was taking the photos. And she took the photos and after she looked at me and said, Paul is so much hipper than both of you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, Paul was always hip, you know, not just how he plays, but how he was, you know, and it's like, and how he talked and he had a very, you know, great sense of humor. And again, he was again the guy who can, you know, play something and suddenly he would make one one hit yeah. and yeah. then a hit and you go, yeah. wow, man, it's swinging yeah. like crazy. But it was just one hit. How do you do that? But when you basically, you have to make at least two hits to swing. Yeah. No, he won. And 
and it's you know it it is really he was spectacular you know that's, I, I love on that record you did uh, he's really swinging like he's still swinging. like also like you know because l later he he started more coloring almost like but on on that songs like you have some up tempos kind of and he's burning on that stuff but you know there is a funny thing which happened and that was because i actually wrote a song which i forgot what is it more south or something like that i don't know it's called you know it's called something and it's kind of like a latin kind of like a bossa nova feel and mm -hmm. i introduced that and you know and 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 paul said you know i never play latin and uh, that's not my thing so i will lay it out on this one you know so now we are recording it me and larry you know and we are in the middle of the song. I, I, I think I, you know, I, I don't know if I started my solo. It's like, and suddenly, bang! And, and Paul just, <laughs> just walked in on this. And of course, he sounds fantastic. And you can really see it's not Latin, it's Paul. Yeah. But I yeah. love the fact that he actually, from out of the blue, made the decision to come in. And yeah. I, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it was, you know, really, it was, you know, I'm so happy that we did that because, yeah. you know, life goes so fast. Anything you plan, do now. <laughs> it's true, actually. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah you never know what will happen. Yeah. You know, just like it's. Uh, yeah. But uh, how did you, Rudy, how did you meet Larry also? He's like in the latest uh, American trailer three also, like. But you seem to have a long story also behind you guys, right? Yeah, we, I mean, we first, so he was always coming to John Schofield for Thanksgiving. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we, so I met Larry like that, you know, and so we kind of all knew each other and I was always saying, well, Larry, you know, I would love to do something. And Larry is, you know, he is a, he's a monster. Yeah, yeah. He is so quiet and he is so nice guy and everything. He starts to play, he's so melodic you know on the bass you know he's really something else i mean it's just it's fantastic and i uh, love him with brad meldau i mean he plays with you know everybody he plays he always makes things so much better yeah it's yeah. it's literally and i have to say that's probably bass is one of these things which really got you know a lot better uh lately but because lately i mean lately last 20 years yeah, so 20 years let's say you know yeah. Before that, it was just few guys who were just like so much better than anybody else. Suddenly, it's a lot of guys who are yeah. really, really good, and uh, and girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, that moves. Yeah. yeah. So, no, but Larry is, you know, in the in the bracket of his own. That's that's for sure. But uh, how how did you decide? Like, uh, you know, I listened to American Trailer, and it's kind of like it, it's like. I want to ask you also about guitars, but uh, it's like your record in a sense of song-wise also, you know, you have acoustic guitars, you you almost have like a Bob Dylan vibe going in between sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like this chords mm -hmm. and, but uh, how did you decide for that trio with Rudy? How, how did you get the idea to get Rudy in the, the group? Well, I have to say that we were supposed to do that recording and uh, and Kenny was supposed to play. Okay. But suddenly Kenny cannot do it. And Kenny said, why don't you call Rudy? And it was like in the last moment. And I know Rudy because Rudy was playing with, you know, he plays with Bill Frisell. Yeah, he plays with everyone, Dave Rudy Douglas. And, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. and, you know, so I saw him a few times at the Village Vanguard. You know, I mean, so I said, well, okay. And, uh, and I kind of adjust the tunes a little bit because, uh, you, you know, I mean, Kenny is Kenny. And he, Kenny is totally different than Rudy. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, but you know, this is really interesting because I have to say, uh, I was, you know, when I was living in Europe as a little kid, <laughs> so I was so much into, you know, that I love jazz. And if it's not jazz, I don't really care about it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Just kind of like, uh, you play country, oh man, just, you know, and uh, if you play with some, you know, singer, I, I don't, and, and it took me quite a bit, you know, to arrive in the United States and start to meet musicians from other genres. Yeah. Who are fantastic, you know, and, and who play. And, and you would say like Johnny Cash or Bob Dylan, you know, and, you, you know, they play with, with, with these amazing guys. And you know that you cannot play like them. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? If it's, even if it's yeah. just chords and how they have the, you know, yeah. and 
they play the rhythm and how they hit the guitar and how can they can keep it steady constantly. And it's just, I suddenly get really, I really started to admire these guys who are, you know, I, Gil Goldstein was playing with Whitney Houston. Really? I didn't know that, really. I mean, and you go like, okay, well, wow. yes. Because, I mean, you know, I, I think it's the, the jazz is much more in every genre here yeah. than in Europe. And, you know, these, these guys, like, uh, you know, there are guys who are playing, um, you know, country who can play Charlie Parker. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. and not bad, actually, you know, and they played on mandolin or whatever it is. And, and, and you suddenly go like, yeah, I mean, you can really see that there is a little different rhythm in everything. You know, yeah. there's a little better, a little groove, a little more, you know, and, and, um, and I, it just happened that suddenly I stopped to, worrying about if I myself, if I play jazz and yeah. I don't worry about it at all. And, and what you can you know, do or not, right? Exactly, yeah. you know, and for yeah. me, it's just, is it, is it listenable as a music? Am I, am I okay with that? Yeah. You know, like an honest thing? And if it is, oh, fine. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it makes sense. But it took me uh, many, many years to get into this. Yeah. It's, I also feel the same now lately, like, you know, in the beginning, it was just like, you know, when you start like, okay, you make an album now, I need a ballad, I need an up tempo. Well, you know the idea, right? And now, like, lately, I'm just, you know, well, if I write eight ballads, it's going to be eight ballads. Fuck it, I don't care, you know, it's... Absolutely. Which also, for me, it starts to be like, if I, if I write eight bars... Yeah. Okay, it's eight yeah. bars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's it's it really starts to be you know, but uh, you know I am I am sixty. I just turned sixty this year, and it's oh, wow. like, you know. And so you, I start to feel like well, you know, uh, I do it for a long time. You know, it just yeah. you, you know what I mean. It's kind of it just creeps on you that you suddenly go like okay, you know, it's you know. Get to some certain point, and you probably cannot get to that point. You know, if I would decided that, you know, like mentally, like yeah. something, so it would be like Bob Dylan. You know, it would probably not be honest. If yeah, I had to kind of get to it in my own speed, on my own terms. But but you always have that, right? Like this. Okay, maybe not those records with uh, George, Ross, and Marvin, but everything later. I think you always have this acoustic electric element going on which i really love yeah and i actually did the did the retrospective which was which came out a few years few years back like five years ago which is called acoustic electric oh like acoustic 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 and electric oh yeah yeah i saw that yeah and it was exactly that concept because i suddenly you know you know when you play violin which is acoustic instrument after you play classical guitar which is acoustic instrument yeah. I love the acoustic instrument. You know, I love yeah, that, yeah. that. That's just you know, it's 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 very different. So, yeah. no, but, but I I just want to uh, ask you one more thing. Uh, since you you said like writing about eight bars, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, <laughs> well, how, how do you get ideas for, or how do you comp you you've composed a lot of music through the years and. Uh, wrote some really beautiful waltzes, I think, especially with John Abercrombie and uh, you, or you can play like this groovy stuff, the one that groovy, how is it? Episode one on the last record or something like that, yeah. which is like really groovy or the ballads and like, how do you write actually? How do you get an idea like for a new album, let's say American trailer, how mm -hmm. does this happen? Like do you say I will write now or does an idea pop up or? Well, you know, uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, now what the when I am in life, uh, I actually like deadlines because I'm pretty lazy by, by nature, you know, and I'm listening yeah. to music all the time and I like wine, you know, and I, you know, and I, my wife cooks great meal and, you know, I yes. like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so it's a, all these things which are, which are just kind of take it, take some time for me. But so I like deadlines. Yeah. I and think good, yeah. I think it's, at least for me, it's important that, uh, you know, bef before, of course, I was just writing for myself and, and I always had tunes, you know, in the drawer, it's just like, and now I suddenly don't. And, and, and when we are recording, 
so I always, you know, I take time and probably in two months, I just write everything. Yeah, okay. And, and I, you know, I kind of, I'm looking more for feels, different feel than for, you know, some kind of, um, and I always try to, to write a melody, you know. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a really hard one. You know, the, to write a melody, and and uh, and uh, uh, so I always, you know, I'm looking for that. You know, John Schofield said to me once this. He said to me, "We all have in ourselves three songs, and we are just trying to figure, you know, write them better and better." And I think he was so right. That's because, a good one. You know, the, um, yeah, as you said, waltzes. I wrote so many waltzes, and it seems to me easy for me to write a waltz. Yeah, I have no idea why, but maybe it's just because yeah. I am from Prague and Vienna is the next door. You know what I mean? And it's waltzes are there, and, yeah. and just suddenly it's easy for me. And uh, so I'm always kind of saying like, oh, maybe I should write a waltz. You know, it's just, and, and after I go, I mean, I wrote so many. Why another one? You know, but so it, it it they are for all of us something which is easier and something which is harder. And I think it's yeah. important to kind of say, go with the stuff which is easy for you and fight with the stuff which is harder for you. Don't give up on that. You, you know what I mean? That it's yeah. always, always kind of like you, you are still trying something, you know, which is like whatever it is, like, you know, swing harder, uh, you know, more bebop-ish, more whatever yeah. it is, what can be, you know, maybe a little challenge for you. But I think it's important. Yeah, definitely. To challenge yourself. Definitely, yeah, that's, that's true, yeah. Cool, Rudy. <laughs> Hawker Jazz.